In this video, we will go on a step by step on how to create a clean energy transition from this into this, and how this can happen in your power system and your country. There are too many policymakers and management people that have way too little clue on how to actually do this. What they'll do is they'll hire a bunch of consultants to consult with and to con, wait, and, and then they pay them a bunch of money for some pages in a report that nobody's gonna read. That is why I'm making this video, to provide some insights onto how this energy transition can be done in an efficient manner. There are stages to this energy transition, and each one of them is important. They fulfill a certain objective. So, pay attention. Stage 1. Get started. The first stage is to start. Start small and just start. Start and learn. Start and fail. But just start. So stop sitting there and thinking for months yeah. and months on end and just get to work and start uploading. Don't think too much and get stuck in analysis paralysis. A lot of people get analysis paralysis and they'll just sit there and they'll plan their first video for three months. and yeah. Assemble your panels, figure out what is an inverter and try to see if you can get it to run. Here is a pro tip and it's going to be so profound. People talk about the I Had a Dream by Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, this is going to be on the same level as that. You ready? Start small and don't overcommit. Oh yeah! FUNSI 2023 If your country starts on allocations and quotas, allocate like 10 or 20 projects of small scale. I repeat, small scale projects. 5 megawatts to 35 megawatts each site. Connect like half of it to the medium voltage network and the other half to the high voltage network. Give him like a 7 to 12 year PPA. But my good sir, we run on a market system. Yeah, 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 shut the fuck up, god damn. Give the fucking PPA. You people subsidize fossil fuels so much and now refuse to start some pilot project on renewables on the basis that it should be a free market. Free market, my ass. At this stage, your objective is not to mass produce anything. It is not to build the world's biggest solar park or the biggest solar park in the region? No. It is not to break any world record, okay? Listen up. You want the headlines or you want the actual green energy? If you want headlines, go ahead, chop down some trees, clear the lands, and build yourself the largest solar park that will be the greatest white elephant constructed. It's not going to function, it's going to have problems, it's not going to work at all. But if you want actual renewable energy, Learn how to put on your pants first before going to drive a car. That is why you need to start small and disperse. Have like 20 small scale projects with different owners, okay? Different owners. It is so that they get different equipments and various setups and configurations. Politicians love talking about diversity, right? They love it until when it comes to assigning government projects. Then the diversity goes right out the window and all the projects are assigned to like three or four companies with like super shady connections. Why do we want diversity here? We want different owners, different equipment setups. We want grid following inverters and grid forming inverters, passive harmonic filters, active harmonic filters, all sorts of different brands of solar panels. Because in a few years, you are going to find out about problems that you have no idea even existed. This inverter is garbage, that panel is bad, these locations get flooded once in a while, sometimes the panels can catch on fire, lightning likes to strike on them for some reason. The main and only objective at this stage is to introduce this new technology and learn how it fits into your unique system. Not mass produce green energy, not accelerate to the next stage, just put on pants before you walk out the door, that's all. Any consultants that says that they have the perfect blueprint to mass produce and scale up renewable energy right from the get-go can go take that blueprint and shove it up their ass. It's not going to work. They don't know your system. They don't know what problems or challenges you are facing. They're just going to run some barely legitimate simulations with thousands of assumptions on their shiny overpriced software and send you a 200 page report and then you pay them like 20 million of taxpayer money. And that is how 99% of countries start on renewable energy transition.
I want to zoom into this Asia Zero Emissions community mm. that Japan is leading. Japan's approach is a little bit different uh, from uh, those opinions, as you as you may aware. Um, because each country's situation uh, is different uh, from country by country. Your, uh, their coal fire power station is already old. So they just say, we're going to demo- demolish those old ones, and we no longer construct a new one. But for example, even in Malaysia, you have a relatively new coal fire power station. And asking you to demolish all those coal fire power stations at this moment is not realistic. Japan's approach is we need a custom-made approach. Recap. Start early and start small. Don't overcommit on size, okay? Size is overrated. Then you pause this video, go do the work, wait two years, observe what kind of problems you will get, and then you come back, okay? Kaizen, guys. Kaizen. Focus on the small improvements first, not just go in with the finished product right away. You're not going to get a finished product right away. By completing step one, you should have around 0.5% or 1% of annual energy generated from hardcore renewables. By that, I mean wind and solar. Hydro and geothermal don't really count because some protesters want to protest. Personally, I don't care if you're 100% coal, like it makes no difference to me. It ain't my business. If you tell me your system runs 100% coal, I'm like, yeah, cool. Yeah, I ain't gonna be mad. In fact, I would even want to visit and learn from you. Like, just don't greenwash it or make claims that makes no sense. Then then we're cool. Well, we're cool. Run 100% fossil fuel, man. We're still cool. I, I have no problems with that. For now, we focus on the hardcore renewables. So that means wind and solar. There's actually a more common term for this. It's called variable renewable energy or VRE, but on this channel, we are calling it Hardcore Renewables. Step 2. Identify what do you currently have. Understand your system. Whoa, 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 whoa. Before you click away thinking that it's going to get too complicated, I understand, okay? We don't have to get too detailed here, okay? We're going to keep it understandable for you management people, this economists and accountants and management people, okay? Step 2 just means what fuel are you running? That's all. That's it. Are you running on gas, coal, hydro? Find out. Because each fuel has a unique characteristics and needs to be dealt with differently. These are the turbines. This is the shaft that connects the turbines to the generator. And the generator basically functions as a dynamo. The dynamo you see on a bicycle. The dynamo basically is the one that generates electricity. First, we look into a coal-fired power plant. The coal fire power plant functions on the grand kind cycle. So we start off here at the coal yard where all the coal is transported with the conveyor belt into this place here where it get mashed up, crushed into bits and bits, shoot in as coal dust. But this kind of dust explodes. The dust is shot inside here, the fire, it feeds the fire, fire burns the coal, it heats up the water. The water travels here, heats up, the water will come in. And it will hit the turbine. The first turbine is the HP turbine. HP in this case means high pressure. At this stage, the water is no longer water, it's steam. And it's not even regular steam, it's dry steam. Steam that you cannot see, it will just cook you immediately. And after it hits the first turbine, the HP turbine, the dry steam gets rechanneled here again. It reheats from the, from the coal. It reheats again, it travels into the IP turbine. IP means intermediate. Intermediate, I don't know how to spell. Okay, intermediate turbine. It's spin another turbine, it helps. This is all single shaft. It helps uh, the HP turbine, like two person cycling on a bike. Instead of one person cycling on a bike, it's now two person cycling on a bike. It helps spin the turbine. And then the steam is now reused again in the LP turbine, the low pressure. It spins, spins, spins the turbine, helping once again, assisting the all three turbines spin together, and it turns the generator. Now this water is now used back, re- decondens, comes back here, and then it goes reheat again to complete the whole cycle. First, we go back into HP again, and that is a whole of how coal fire power plant functions. Essentially, this is the Rankine cycle. 
you pump the water up, cause it to heat up, it boils, turns into steam, water into steam, the steam will come and push the turbine, the turbine comes here, it cools, it condenses, it cools, and once it's cooled, it goes to the pump again. So the heat in is very important. The heat in, the energy and the work comes in here, comes out the heat out. This goes to the generator. Generator, the dynamo. When I was a student actually, I was like pretty confused. Why do we need a condenser actually? This condenser part really doesn't, I don't get it at that point. Why can't we just like take out the U steam and then we feed it back in? Since we're going to heat it up again, why do we need to cool it down first? before we heat it up again. That doesn't make sense to me. Why don't we just bypass the cool down part? Just push it through. At first, it didn't make sense. Only much, much later on when I start working, I'm like, oh, it concepts hit me. So here is the why it needs to cool down. Here is why it needs a condenser. We have very high pressure steam, HP, high pressure steam, coming to the turbine. It's gonna push the turbine blades and make the thing happen. But this condenser actually, it creates a low pressure environment. When it releases all the heat out, it creates a low pressure environment and basically it sucks out all the movement, making this turns a lot more faster. Spins better. Now, oh my god, it, might, it makes sense now. That's why we cool it off and we, we, and we condense the, the steam to actually create a suction so that the turbine actually spins better because if it's just high pressure here and high pressure here, then steam is not going to travel well. But if there's high pressure here and low pressure, then it's forced the order steam through. And that's what makes the rain kind cycle works a lot more better. Area under the graph. And if we talk about nuclear, it's really is very similar nuclear and coal the structure because nuclear is basically, you split the atoms, it creates heat, and then the engineer's like, yeah, steam turbine go brrrr. So re instead of this, replace this part with the nuclear chamber. Nuclear chamber. And it produces heat. It heats up the same thing. It heats up the, the water, turns into steam, goes through the turbine, comes back, reheat, goes through the secondary turbine, goes through the third turbine, spins the generator, cools down, condense, and then reheat the water again, and the cycle continues. That is nuclear. And nuclear has an efficiency of around 33-37%. That's nuclear efficiency. People might say, oh my god, it's surprisingly low. Yeah, coal is like 30-50% to 50 efficiency, like half of, more than half of the energy produced by the coal is actually not produced, is not generated into electricity. It's just inefficient and just it's not inefficient it's just wasted and not captured and then some people will be saying oh my god it's so inefficient oh, why are we using this kind of stuff you look at your internal combustion car yeah the cars on the road your bmw your mercedes yeah those internal combustion engines are like 10 percent efficiency yeah the amount of petrol you fill up in your tank only 10 percent of it is used to move your car forward and backwards the rest of it the 90 percent is just released as heat unused energy wasted energy yeah 90 percent of your petrol tank is just stuck there doing nothing next we have the gas turbine okay where do we start in this one it looks very complicated so here we see natural gas this is the injection point of natural gas and here is the injection point of gas oh, oh no sorry here is the injection point of air air so gas turbine actually is very unique you need to combine air and gas together this is a compressor compressor it compresses the air hot air it injects into mixed with natural gas very very compressed hot natural gas methane and it burns it's basically functions like a jet engine it's just explosion explosion happening explosion controlled explosion happening inside this chamber here and that's what spins the turbine. It's very similar to how a jet engine functions. This gas turbine uses the principle of Brayton cycle. That's in jet engine as well. And when this turns, it spins the whole shaft. Let me use another color for the shaft. 
and this spins the generator. Vroom vroom, the generator makes electricity. The thing is, this is a combined cycle. The combined cycle means there are two cycles. One, Brayton cycle is a gas, and the other one is the Rankine cycle. The Rankine cycle uses the hot air expelled out from the first cycle, and very similar to the coal plant, it heats up the hot air. It heats up the hot air, the steam. Here, HP turbine reheats it. Reheats it. This is very hot chamber. Let me label the hot chamber. Here is a hot chamber where all the hot air is. Very, very hot air. Any birds that fly above this, we get cooked. KFC. So they heat up all this water, turns into steam, spins the first turbine, comes back, reheats, spins the second turbine, the IP turbine, spins the LP turbine, the low pressure turbine, comes back, condenses, releases all the hot air. The condenser basically sucks in all this, makes the turbine spins better. Pump pump the cool water back up into the into the chamber. So then you have one cycle here. So now you have one cycle here, which is a gas turbine, and you have a second cycle, which is a steam turbine. And that's why I call it a combined cycle. This I'm showing here is two different generators, generator one, generator two. Sometimes they are one single shaft, meaning that this shaft actually connects to this shaft. So it's one huge train. They call it a power train. And that's why I call it a single shaft combined cycle. So that is what the gas turbine is. The efficiency of this, because, because there's two cycles, we reuse the heat, reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. Yeah, we reduce the heat from the gas turbine into making extra energy here. So the efficiency actually goes up to 60%. One of the more high efficient um, generators out there, this kind of configuration. And next we have the hydropower plant. Hydropower plant, you look for the water. This is the water, this is the dam, the dam. Let me re erase this part here, yeah. The dam. So this water is siphoned out and comes here. It spins this turbine here. This turbine has a shaft. Let me use another color for the shaft. The shaft spins the generator. Your dynamo is here now. So this is how a turbine looks like. If you, the water comes, spins it. Water releases in the dark draft tube, and this is called a tail water. Important thing you need to important thing about the hydro is the head. This is called a head. The higher the head, the more water, the more power you can actually achieve with lesser water. And search tank in case if suddenly you close here. The water comes in and then it gets because here is low pressure now, it sucks back in and instead of hitting this dam again, you just surge tank here. The water comes out and it's a safety protection feature. Pretty simple. The very nice thing about hydropower plant is that the efficiency is 90%, very high. There is very little losses and most of the power is used. Hydro plants are very different they are very diverse hydro, hydro plants are very diverse in a sense that you have low storage plants where the dam is not the, not too big but they're high in power because they have a huge head and they can just it's more for power it saves the system but it's not to run 24 hours because it doesn't have that much of water and you have more storage dams where you have lots and lots of water and just the, the generator just keep running 24 hours and you have run of the river meaning that you don't really dam the whole thing, just if the water comes in the river, it just runs. And if it doesn't, it doesn't run at all. Those are, and then there are much more smaller ones, mini hydro. Yeah, very, very diverse actually, this hydro. So let's do the recap. Coal uses a steam turbine, they run on steam. Nuclear uses steam turbine, they run on steam. Hydro uses a water turbine, they run on water. Geothermal, steam turbine. Solar and wind, runs on magic. Give a gas. This is the tricky part, okay? Gas turbines runs on gas and air. 
Yes, that is right. The rest of the thing runs on a pure fuel. But gas turbine runs on mixed fuel, okay? Gas and air. It's very important. There's a small difference there. That's why gas turbines are a bit more sensitive compared to the rest. They need more delicate fuel mix. Okay, step three. You need to understand how do you consume electricity. By that, what we mean is figure out your consumption profile. This is a consumption profile of the UK. How the UK consumes electricity in a day. And this is Japan. And this is France. And this is Western Australia. The base load is the amount of power of the system that we always need. Rain or shine, day or night, Democrat or Republican. This is the amount of power that's always needed in the system. Peak load is the highest amount of load the power system can achieve. We are ignoring the seasonal factors here for now, okay? Let's focus on a daily basis. When the seasonal factors kick in, the profile might slightly differ. Let's stick to the basic one-day cycle. For some systems, they have a relatively close base load and peak load. Meaning that the base load and peak load is much more closer than we think. There is very little expandability. What you call it is, it's relatively flat. The more violent system is that when the peak is two times or more than the base loads. That's what you call a system that expands a lot. Let's look into some countries and their system. The profile of Japan here, in this case, Tokyo metropolitan area, is what you consider a flat profile. You see here that the base load and the peak load is relatively close to each other. There's very little differences and it's a relatively flat profile. So this is what you consider a flat profile. Similarly in France, the base load which happens early in the wee hours and the peak load that happens at night during dinner is also very close to each other comparatively. It doesn't take much to ramp up from the base load to the peak load. So this is another one you consider as a flat profile. However, in the UK, this is a different story. The base load and the peak load has huge differences and it's much more violent. There's a huge gap and there's a very massive ramping requirement. This is what you consider a violent profile. In New Zealand, we see a pretty unique profile. The base load happens very early on and the peak load happens very early on as well. This is something that I do not see very often. You would not categorize this as violent or flat, but it is somewhere in between. The peak load is almost double the base load. Yeah, it's somewhere in between. It needs some expandability there as well. And in Western Australia, this is what you consider a pretty violent profile. There's a lot of ramping up and down here, a lot of erraticness, a lot of chaoticness. And this is what you consider as a pretty violent profile. Why is this important? It is important to learn this so that you can know how to cater for your demand curve. By understanding how your electricity consumption behaves, you can now properly design or plan how to satisfy the electricity demand. There is a huge complicated method to properly optimize this. But let's stick to the rule of thumb. If a system is more base loady, then plant up more base load plants. If a system is more expandable, then you need more generators that is able to expand and collapse. Start up when you need the energy and shut down when you don't need it. That is the rule of thumb. So let's look into the fuel type. Coal plants, nuclear plants, they are very much base load. They do not like to shift their load up and down. They do not like to expand or collapse. They want to stick to a value and the value is there the whole day. They do not like to change. Gas, and I especially combined cycle gas, they are more intermediate. They are more capable to expand and collapse compared to the steam turbines of coal and nuclear. Then you have hydro. Hydro is very expandable and collapsible. The limiting factor is not the machine, it's more the river. Like if you shut down the whole hydro station, meaning is there going to be water in the river anymore? If you shut off the whole river, then there might be a problem. When you're able to identify which kind of generation fits which kind of demand needs, then you're able to do planning much more easier. By understanding all this, you will get a clearer picture of how to actually do an energy transition. Each country is unique and you need to figure out a proper plan for it. I've been rambling too much in this video and if it gets a lot of support then maybe I'll do a part 2 because there's so much left uncovered. You're watching the Funsi channel. Do, 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 do.